I help people be kind online. This is a tricky topic because we're the first generation of parents and teachers raising digital kids without having been digital kids ourselves. That makes teaching our kids about how to be online different than just about anything else that we have to teach them. For instance, do you remember learning how to drive? I do. When I was 16 years old, my dad was forced into teaching me how to drive. And I say forced because what I know now that I didn't know then is that it's actually not that fun to teach a kid how to drive. And it kind of goes against everything else that we do as parents, which is try to protect our kids. But nonetheless, my dad rose to the challenge and he had a plan. He was going to take me to a nearby parking lot because it was enclosed and mostly empty. And he was going to show me four things. He's going to show me where to put the key, how to turn the car on, where the gas was and where the brakes were. And once he showed me those four things, I was driving. But here's the thing about that parking lot. It was mostly empty, but there were still curbs and there were still trees. And as slowly as I was driving, my dad noticed that I was getting awfully close to both curbs and trees. So he said, stop. And I was a really good listener, so I did stop. I stopped everything I was doing. I took my hands off that wheel. <laughs> I took my feet off those pedals. And that car sure was still going. <laughs> So my dad and I went back and forth like that just a few times until he finally understood that I just wasn't get it, getting it. I didn't understand that when he said stop, he meant stop the car. So he said that instead, the really, really strong Russian accent coming out. And I did stop after I hit the curb and possibly that tree. When I go to teach my own kids how to drive, I am absolutely going to remember to use the word stop the car, maybe even with a Russian accent. And that's how it goes, just about everything that we go to teach our kids. We can fall back on what we were taught when we were little. But social media is different. We're the first generation of parents and teachers raising digital kids without having been digital kids ourselves. So we can't fall back on those lessons from our youth. What happens with social media is our kids turn a certain age or their friends start getting Instagram accounts or we need them to babysit their younger siblings and we hand them phones and accounts and passwords and we send them out into these unchartered territories, mostly unmonitored and untaught by us. And the truth is, our kids are suffering for it. 42% of our kids are cyberbullied. 81% of our kids report thinking that it would be much easier to get away with cyberbullying than regular bullying. And cyberbullied kids are 2 to 9% more likely to attempt suicide than their non-bullied peers. In Minnesota, a seventh grader named Rachel Emke committed suicide after being bullied both in person and online. At school, her locker was defaced and her books were glued shut and she had taken to hiding out in the locker room just to get away from her bullies. But once the bullying went online, she couldn't get away from them anymore. They were wherever her phone was. Rachel hung herself in her mom's living room and her dad was the first one to find her. Rachel's story is devastating, but it's not unique. And those statistics are frightening, but they're not changing. Even though cyberbullying has been around for more than a decade, and even though bullying prevention programs have been around since I was in school. In my time studying social media, I have found that it is the parents and teachers in our kids' lives that can make the biggest difference for those statistics and for kids like Rachel. And there's a reason why we're the perfect people to teach them everything they need to know. We literally teach our kids hundreds and thousands of things, and they learn that many things from us. And this starts from the very beginning. When my son Brody was born in 2008, he made me a mom for the third time. He also showed me for the third time that it's really, really hard to be a mom. <laughs> my girls were only four and two at the time, and I was desperate to keep the closeness that I had with them. So I created little rituals throughout our day, small routines where they could be a part of taking care of our new baby. When I needed to feed Brody, they wanted to feed their baby. And when I wanted to read to Brody, they wanted to read to their babies. And as it turned out, when I needed to change Brody's diaper, they wanted to learn how to change diapers. I totally taught them how to do that. We laid our babies down on their backs, and we talked about how you never touch the old diaper until the new one was completely ready to go. And we practiced changing diapers really, really fast to avoid any accidents. 
I taught it and they learned it, and that is just how it goes with parenting and teaching. We teach them what they need to know. So the real question is, if we are so good at teaching our kids, and they are so amazing at learning from us, why haven't we been able to teach our kids to be bully-proofed yet? The answer, as it turns out, can be found in train tracks. You guys play with these when your kids were little? All three of my kids were absolutely obsessed with them. So my husband and I have logged in many, many, many hours on very old, tired knees, building really cool tracks. But what we'd find when we were done playing is that we had built one set of really great tracks with its ups and downs and hills and valleys and another set that was equally great. But there's always a gap in between the two that none of the leftover pieces that we had ever fit. So we left them disconnected. That missing piece is like the missing conversations that we are not having with our kids about cyberbullying and online kindness because no one ever had them with us. So we don't know to have them. This is what I lay at night thinking about. I try to figure out how to get that missing piece into the hands of parents and teachers so we can make a difference in those statistics and we can make a difference for stories and children like Rachel. What I want to tell you is how I got here. How I went from being a mom and a blogger and a writer to someone who wakes her husband up in the middle of the night to discuss online kindness. In the summer of 2014, my husband and I celebrated our 12th wedding anniversary. So I did what we writers do, and I wrote a tidy article called 12 Secrets Happily Married Women Know. I turned it into my editor, along with a picture from our wedding, and I didn't really think about it again. Until a few days later, when I went back to read the comments. We tell our writers to never, ever read the comments, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and I saw that reason firsthand that day. Because when I did read those comments, what I saw is that people weren't commenting about marriage, or weddings, or my article, or my writing. What they were commenting on is how fat I looked in my wedding dress. We get it, Huff and Puff. You love big women, fat women. We get it. Enough is enough. I love, love, love that you used a picture of a bigger girl as the bride. One thing you didn't learn is don't marry a heifer. When I read those words, I was stunned and I was devastated. I only showed them to my husband because I was also embarrassed and ashamed but because I didn't tell anyone, I was also very much alone. I sank into a depression, and I cut myself off from both my online and my in-person support systems. The reason that this hit me so hard is because I thought that I was safe. But the truth is that no one is safe. There is no such thing as bully-proofing. This could happen to anyone. And when it happens to our kids, they feel many of the same things that I felt, but they have far fewer years behind them to fall back on, to let them know that they're going to be okay. And they haven't known themselves long enough to know what it is that they personally need to do to pull themselves back up. That's why so many kids take so long to come back from being cyberbullied and why some of them, like Rachel, never do. When I clawed my way out of my depression, I wrote a second article, and that article was called It Happened to Me. I wrote an article about marriage, and all anyone noticed is that I'm fat. And in that article, I said two things. I said, let's not talk about other people's bodies, and let's all be a lot kinder to each other online. After all of this happened to me, something interesting happened at our house. My own tween, decided that she would like to get online. Her friends were getting Instagram accounts and she wanted in. And I have to tell you that looking at her and having that conversation after everything that had just happened, I understood exactly how my dad must have felt being forced to teach me how to drive. Because even though I was fully aware that I was looking into the eyes of a kind, smart, mature young lady who's perfectly capable of learning how to use social media, what I felt was her baby eyes looking at me. And all I wanted to do was protect her. 
So we sat down together, and we took a look at social media accounts of kids who we knew. Nice, kind, smart kids with really great, involved parents who are mostly technologically savvy. And what I saw about how those kids were using social media told me everything I needed to know about why those statistics look like they do and why stories like Rachel's and mine still happen today. Kids use social media to check on their own social statuses, but also to keep other people's social statuses in check. They're using their tags to include and exclude. And they're using their bio lines to show who's in and who's out, and also to meet people outside of the apps that their parents have approved of. Kids are using their comments to ask to be rated and to rate other people. And they are checking on their social status hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a day. We hold in our hands the missing piece between the good, kind, smart kids whom we know and love and those very same kids who are being so reckless with themselves and with each other online. That missing piece is a short, direct, repeated, ongoing conversations, not about how to become bully-proofed, but about how to make sure that they're the ones who are not doing the bullying and that no one else is either. Just like we teach our kids those hundreds and thousands of other things that we do, we can teach them how to be online. We can teach them that there's a difference between intent and impact. How loud and permanent the internet is, that there's no such thing as online privacy, but there is a difference between fighting issues and people. And we can teach them that on the other side of every single interaction that they have online is a real human being. We are the first generation of parents and teachers raising digital kids without having been digital kids ourselves. And that does make it a tricky conversation. But what I'm asking of you is to commit to having those game-changing conversations and to actively work towards squashing those statistics until they're shocking because they're outdated. And I'm asking you to watch out for each other and each other's children online so we can have a safer, kinder internet for all of us. And that is how we can move away from anti-bullying programs that just aren't working to pro-kindness ones that absolutely do. Thank you.